Well, last week in our inaugural sermon in the book of Philippians, we discussed how our society is in the grip of relationship-killing selfism. It's all about me. It's all about my special interests. It's all about me making sure my voice is heard. I want to express myself no matter what you think about it. And I want my rights, and I want them now. Thank you very much. The symptoms of our self-absorbed culture are everywhere. For example, in recent years we've seen the dramatic decrease in the marriage rates. Well below half of the adult population is married. It's not like we've seen a sudden outpouring of the Holy Spirit to give people the gift of singlehood. No, we've seen the rise the precipitous rise in the live-in culture. People want the benefits of marriage without the obligations. So once that newness factor that Tommy spoke of today wears off, I can discard you without recourse. Just a few weeks ago, Easter Sunday, some of you may have read in the paper that uh, at an Easter egg hunt up in Connecticut, it was ruined when hundreds of parents stormed the field to make sure that their kids got little plastic eggs filled with candy. And in the process, these parents trampled children. And of course, at this point, we're nearly numb. From every Black Friday, what do we hear stories of? People being trampled, and fighting, all to save a few bucks off of some item. Our culture is increasingly fractured. And survey and study and poll after poll after study after survey say the same thing. Fewer people report the presence of meaningful relationships in their lives. It's hard to have meaningful relationship when you're in the grip of selfism. But of course, social media was born to supposedly fill this void. People have fewer meaningful relationships. Well, here we come to save the day. We're going to facilitate meaningful relationships for you. That was the promise. And yet... Studies show that protracted use of social media actually detracts from personal happiness. And as of 2015, one in five divorces cite social media use as a contributing cause. Happiness is elusive in this world. We're so wrapped up in ourselves and making sure we get happy that it's actually really hard to find. And so since we can't seem to find it in our things and in our relationships, we've seen a rise in this vacuous, vacuous notion of spirituality. And people turn their eyes even to God, saying, what can you do for me? We are the consummate consumer society. We have adopted the mindset that other people are just like our things. They are either a facilitator of or an obstacle to our happiness. And so we entertain them, we tolerate them, we use them. Until we get whatever good we can out of them or until we decide that it's no longer worth the investment and then we discard them. And of course, we all know that everyone else is doing the same thing. And so our relationships are marked by a cheap commitment and a jaded, cynical, skeptical outlook. It's hard to have community. And so we go on, like a homeless person going from one dumpster to the next, 
not really looking for a change, just looking for that piece of garbage that'll make their life a little bit better. That's us. We need help, do we not? We are hopeless. And that's where the gospel comes in and says, you know what? You think the problem is out there. The gospel tells us that the problem is in here. You and I, we are the problem. And so, in our last week's sermon, we saw how Paul writes to his beloved church at Philippi. And he tells them, hey, Grace and peace, this blessing that you want, this blessed life, this full life that you're wanting, it comes as a gift, extra nos in the Latin, outside of us, from God. And it's something that's worked in here. And Paul gently, gently, but still very clearly, reveals to his beloved congregation that the key to getting along in community is not to relentlessly insist on our rights. It's rather to drop the ego and to remember that we are all in this together as servants, people who live for the total whims and will of another. It's not about us. It's not about our agenda. It's about our king. And so, if we will drop our ego, we just might have a chance. Now in this week's message, we want to look at how it is that you and I, in the midst of a culture, in the midst of a context in which we have been conditioned to find other people, quite frankly, annoying, how can we have relationship? You see, not only does the gospel set us free from the need to pursue our own agenda and protect our own ego, the gospel sets us free to view other people as something other than objects, as either a roadblock to happiness or a tool for my happiness. The gospel transforms our perspective of other people. Now what we need in Christian life and what the Christian gospel gives to us is the good news of joy. Our culture, which is characterized by cynicism and, and, and negativity, is in direct contrast to an outlook of joy. And here in our passage today, oh, we see the first use of the word in this book. But what is joy? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, you'll see that it says something along the lines of the sensation of pleasure, the sensation of delight, the experience of happiness. That is what the dictionary says. In other words, joy in the dictionary's understanding of it, is an emotion that you experience when you have something pleasurable happen. But that is not the Bible's notion of joy. When you do a study of the concept of joy in Scripture, you see that it is not the response of, of, of me to something that happens. No. Joy is an outlook it is a positive disposition that is based upon confidence in the sure word of God, based upon the past, the present, and the future. Let me say that again. What is joy according to the Bible? What is joy? It's a positive outlook that is based upon the confidence we have in the sure word of God concerning the past, the present, and the future. To allow me to restate, joy is what we have when we understand and grasp the end of the story. And it enables us to interpret our circumstances in the light 
of that end. I have five kids, and so I have lots of opportunity to conduct social experiments. And so I will routinely have them do chores because I'm also a taskmaster. And uh, I'll tell my kids, you have to do all this work. And now occasionally I'll pull one or two of them off to the side and I'll say, hey, afterwards we're going to go get milkshakes from Chick-fil-A or something like that, okay? But you don't tell anybody, it's a secret. Now, how do you imagine the kids who are in possession of that knowledge approach their work compared to the others? It doesn't take a genius to figure that out, does it? But that's what joy does in a bigger scale. It enables us to look at the here and now and in a sense look past it because we know that something great is coming. Now, it's important to keep in mind That joy as it is understood in Scripture is not an emotion, it is an attitude. But here's the rub. As an attitude, it influences our emotions. I have a couple teenagers. And teenagers are famous for having a bad attitude. Now, does that mean that they're always upset? No, but when someone has a bad attitude, they almost have this disposition to being irritated, right? Happiness is short-lived, and grouchiness is protracted. That attitude they have is distinct from their emotions, but it informs their emotions. So when I say that joy is an attitude... I'm saying that it is possible to go through some really crummy circumstances and to not be happy. Like Paul, later in this book, is going to say that the death of his beloved friend would have caused him sorrow upon sorrow. He would have been sad. Does that mean that he would not have been joyful? No. The emotions we feel when we interpret them through our attitude quickly bring us back to whatever our standing equilibrium is. And so since we are to be characterized by joy and our attitude is to be one of an upbeat, positive perspective based upon a confidence in the sure word of God concerning the past, the present, and the future, that means when those bad things happen and we're sad or we're angry or we're disappointed, that we're able to bounce back to our equilibrium because we are confident in what? The sure word of God concerning the past, the present, and the future. I, in my day, have done a lot of funerals. Most of them have been for non-believers. Every time a veteran dies, they're entitled to a government-paid funeral service. And so I've done my fair share of them. And there is a marked difference between the funeral of a non-believer and the funeral of a believer. I've never been to a believer's funeral where no one was not sad. I mean, people are always sad. But there's this undercurrent of joy. And you can go to a non-believer's funeral, and sometimes they'll say some you know, pleasant memories or whatever, but there's this unsettling sense of finality. They don't have it. Now, we... We need joy in our lives, and it comes from having that grasp of God's sure word concerning the past, the present, and the future. That is why it comes, it's part and parcel of growth and and, and maturity in the faith. If you know little of God's word, if you've experienced little of God's grace, then it's hard to have a good tight grasp. And so your sensation and experience of joy is likely to be diminished. We need to know God's word. But what about joy in relationship? What would it look like for me to view all of you with an attitude and perspective of joy? For me to interpret you through that positive, upbeat perspective that is based upon confidence in the sure word of God 
in the past, present, and future? How might that affect our relationships? That's what Paul is going to show us today. In this passage, in addition to introducing the concept of joy, he shows us how gospel joy affects our relationships in at least three ways. First, it shapes our perceptions about others. Gospel joy shapes your perceptions about others. Second, gospel joy cements our commitment to others. And third, gospel joy gives us a desire for the greatest good of others. So it shapes our perception of others, commitment to others, and pursuit of the greatest good for others. If you would, please, come back to your Bible. And what I want to do is walk you through each of these points. We're going to look at the first point. Gospel joy shapes our perceptions about others. And we're going to look at verses 3 through 6 for this. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, the first thing to note in this passage is the repeated use of all, every. He's wanting to make it clear that what he's about to say is not limited to his few pet friends, his, the, the people who don't give him any trouble or, or are on a pain in his neck or whatever. It's the whole kitten caboodle congregation. The person you like, the person you don't. All of it. Now read this as if he's talking directly to you to understand. I thank my God in my every remembrance of you fill in your name always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership again fill in your name in the gospel from the first day until now and i am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to the completion at the day of jesus christ so verses three and four are statements of fact, I thank my God every time I remember you and every prayer of mine, every prayer of mine with joy. Okay, so joy is his attitude that he regards these people. Because he has joy, when he looks at them, he's thankful for them and he holds them in their heart. And why does he do that? Does he hold them in his heart? Does is, is he have a great attitude towards them? Because they're such awesome people, they sing great, they give a lot to the church, they, they serve well. What is the reason for his thankful attitude? Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Sometimes people bother us, don't they? They annoy us, they rub us the wrong way, they disappoint us, they let us down. And Paul is here saying, look, the reason why I view you so highly is because of your partnership in the gospel. Now, what does it mean to be partners in the gospel? It means at least two things. First, we share a common experience. We share a common belief with Christ. We share a common anchor point. Did you know that when a believer has a relationship with another believer, every relationship is a triangle? You, You have a relationship with that other person, but you each have a relationship with a reference point outside of yourself, Christ, and Christ becomes the anchor point for that relationship. So that no matter what transpires between the two of you, you still retain this common anchor point. And it is because of what the gospel has previously taught Paul about himself, that he was lost, that he was dead, that he was desperately in need of a Savior. And Jesus did not kick me to the curb 
when I was an enemy of his, but rather he forgave me, he accepted me, and he commissioned me. And that has been your experience with Jesus as well. So how can I view you as someone to be kicked to the curb when you annoy me? We have a shared relationship with a common anchor point that provides the potential for incredible resiliency in relationships. Will we act on it? But it also means something else. The second thing that a partner in the gospel means is that we are on a common mission. We share a common purpose. Great endeavors in human history do a remarkably good job of teaching us the value of a shared mission. When people are filled with a sense of purpose, it overcomes all other divisions. And that driving goal unites. So not only have they shared in the experience of grace, but having tasted it, they are on a mission together. And they view each other as teammates. They're not all the pitcher. They're not all the catcher. They're not all the star shortstop. But together, they fill out the team and they're on a mission. So, if I've experienced grace and grace has taught me my need and you've experienced grace and grace has taught you your need, how can we view each other as burdens? people to be discarded. Our shared reference point anchors us and puts us on a mission together. Did you know that when God put you in relationship with other people, it wasn't to stroke your ego. It wasn't for you to stroke theirs. God put sinful, bumpy, lumpy, messed up people in relationship with each other for the precise purpose of sanctification in our lives. And oftentimes it is through the friction that occurs where those rough edges are made smooth and we are fitted for heaven. Don't resist the process. Embrace the other because Christ has embraced the other and set us on a common mission. So think of someone who is perhaps in your family or in this church who drives you nuts. Are they someone to be used and abused and you, 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 you suck whatever good out of them you can and then they, you just discard the dried up husk in the trash? No. They're your partner in the gospel. Treat them as such. But more than just orienting our perspective to viewing people as partners, if we have a positive outlook based upon our confidence in God's sure word, it cements our bond. Look at verse 7. Gospel joy cements our commitment to others. In verse 7, he expounds upon his confidence. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So in verse 7, he's elaborating on his joyful attitude, and he reiterates the same reason that he gives in verse 5. In fact, the word partner in verse 5 is the same basic Greek word as partaker in verse 7. So he's, it's, he's the same basic concept, and it's this shared mission, this shared experience that is the unifying factor here, and it cements them together. These people love Paul. In a day in which people were ashamed to be seen with someone who was on the margins of society, these people were so committed to Paul and his ministry that they have just sent a messenger over 1,200 land miles to check in on him because they care. Their commitment to Paul and being a partaker of grace in his imprisonment, and in the defense of the gospel, through thick and thin, no matter what you're doing, Paul, we are with you. 
It manifested itself in love. Love in personal loyalty. Love in material support. Love in consistent prayer. And love reflected in encouragement. And that was because of the gospel working in their lives. How do we take care of our own? What do we do? Do you see that if we have an outlook like Paul, where we are convinced that these partners in grace, these partakers of the gospel with us, that they are works in progress, and that God is not going to give up on them, and that no matter how low we may feel, we can have confidence in the end of the story, which we get in verse 6, that God will complete what He began. How can I give up on you when you're being difficult, or when you're being trying, or when you're being hurt? So how do we take care of our own? Do we shoot our wounded? Or do we lovingly nurture those who need it? I invite you to consider how the gospel might cement our relationships together and expressions of love that manifest in personal loyalty, encouragement, self-sacrifice, material support, and in fact, in prayer. God's on a mission. And He wants little old you and little old me to come together to be partners in the spread of the kingdom. And what's cool about the church is that a lot of metaphors can be used to describe it. It's a place where sick people go to get better. It's a place where, where people go to, to, to work out and then learn how to do ministry. It's, it's a whole bunch of things. Being from a military background, I like to think of it as an operating base, as a forward operating base out there in hostile territory. And from the safety of this base, we are equipped, we are rested, we are built up so that we can make excursions out into hostile territory. You may think that's a little far-fetched, but later in this book we will see that we're called a colony of the kingdom of heaven. Colonies in that day... They're a part of a mother country that exists geographically separate from the country and they are surrounded by foreign entities. We're a colony of the kingdom of heaven seeking immigrants, so to speak. We want rebels to become sons and daughters. And we need to be on the same page for that. But the gospel doesn't only give us a perspective that shapes our joy in terms of perspective and our joy in terms of commitment, but it also gives us a perspective of joy in regards to pursuit of the greatest good of the other. What do you think is the greatest good of one another? What's the best thing you can do or give to someone else? What is the best thing that I need or the most important thing that you need? What can we give each other? Well, here Paul tells us in verses 8 through 11. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Okay, so verse 8 restates and emphasizes how much he loves them. Don't for a second, we, we, we get so caught up in reminding ourselves that love is not just an emotion. Love is a commitment that we can sometimes think that love has no emotional component at all. And it does. Paul desires them. He yearns for them with the affection of Christ Jesus himself. In other words, imagine as much as Jesus loves you As much as I can imagine Jesus loving you, that's how much I love you. It's a powerful love. Okay, so he restates that. But then he says what he prays for. He prays that they would have more love. That it would abound more and more. 
And it's not just love in the sappy, sentimental sense. It's love that is characterized by knowledge and discernment. Why do they need love that abounds with knowledge and discernment? For the purpose of verse 10, so that they may approve what is excellent. There's so many good things that you could choose that amidst the buffet of good, you might not recognize the best. And Paul wants us to recognize the best. Why does he want us to recognize the best? So that in verse 10b, we may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Okay. Let's work through this backwards to see how our greatest good is connected here. I could actually walk this passage backwards and, sh and show you, I want you to be holy. I want you to be presented to Jesus pure and blameless when He returns. I want you to manifest the fruit of the Spirit upon His return. But in order to do that, you need to be able to discern what is the best thing for you to be doing. But you are not going to be able to discern what is the best thing for you to be doing unless your love for God, for each other, for the truth, unless it abounds with wisdom and knowledge. And you're not going to have that unless God gives it to you. And so I pray for you. Paul wants the best for his people. So he prays for them. Oftentimes we think in terms of, I want to pray that my kids will stay out of trouble, or that my kids grow up well, or that my kids go to a great college, or my kids get a great job, that this lesion on my leg is nothing, that, that my job is secure, that my marriage won't fall apart, that our church won't die, that, that, that our nation won't fracture, that we pray for all these things. And none of it's bad. But did you know that none of the recorded prayers in the Bible are about stuff like that? It's always about what makes you holy. Because in the final analysis, we are going to stand before the judge. And how well your portfolio did isn't going to really matter. What will matter is how much fruit have you borne? And so when Paul recognizes this, it fuels his prayers for his people. He loves his people so much that he wants the best for them, which is to stand before Christ ready. How do we pray for one another? Do you pray for one another? In virtually none of the counseling sessions that have come before me with marital conflict have I found that they are praying for each other. When we pray for one another, it might be some abstract prayer, you know, please help his, 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 his test this week to go well, or please help this person to stop being such a pain in my neck. Please help them see the error of their ways, Lord. That's not really a prayer for them. Not in the sense that Paul is praying for his people here. Do you pray? that your elders, that your deacons, that your pastor would be holy? Do you pray that the person who annoys you to no end, that they would grow in wisdom and knowledge, that they would discern what is best, and so they can be pure and blameless and filled with the fruit of righteousness at the day of judgment? And oh yeah, as we manifest all that, how do you think our lives together will be? A little better, maybe? Maybe? Prayer is an amazing thing. It brings us before the one who can give us everything we need. And isn't that kind of what Paul said in verse 2 in the introduction? When he reminds his folks that the grace and the peace, the blessing that they're wanting, doesn't come from their strivings. It comes as a gift from God. 
Paul understands, verse 6, well, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Because of that, he rejoices in their partnership in the gospel. He knows that he is looking and talking to imperfect works in progress. And the thing about imperfect works in progress is they're going to do things that bother us. But I'm an imperfect work in progress. So I can't be a hypocrite. I want to be loved, so I need to love. And I can have confidence that no matter how down I feel about me or about you, that he who began that good work will bring it to completion. So in light of the end of the story, why not, when I look at you, see that and think, praise God that we're a room full of works in progress that he will bring to completion. And in the final day, we will all be made perfect. And in the meantime, we are sharing that experience of being perfected and we are sharing the mission. We're on a journey together, on a mission together. And that joy cements us in relationship and leads us to want the best for each other. When you pray for others, pray for their best, not just their good. And in so doing, you're fulfilling Paul's prayer here that we would know what is best. So as we leave here today, consider Do I have a firm grasp of the sure word of God concerning the past, present, and future? And does that knowledge result in an upbeat attitude knowing the end of the story? And how can I reflect that onto my relationships with others with a gospel sense of joy? The gospel affects our relationships. It orients us away from that cynical, selfish perspective to an outlook that is truly others-oriented. And therein lies the recipe for a church, a family on mission. Let's pray. Word of God speaks.